Assalamu alaikum. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jalaluddin, working as professor and head of cardiology department at Bolan Medical College Hospital uh, and at Civil Hospital currently posted there. Uh, I welcome you all to the fifth installment of our, our cardio web series organized by Pakistan Cardiac Society. Uh, we all are delighted to host this webinar from Quetta, focusing on the guideline directed medical management of heart failure. Uh, we know heart failure is quite common. This web series started from preventive cardiology and then ischemia and currently on heart failure. Heart failure can be systolic, it can be diastolic. And uh, our today's main talk would be on heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. Uh, it's a global disease. It affects millions of people worldwide and the guidelines are changing and there are a lot of new molecules uh, that have come in the business. The treatment of heart failure has quite improved over the last couple of decades. As our tre tre treatment with med medically and surgically is improving, the number of heart patients globally are increasing. Uh, so before I call upon our today's speaker, uh, let me introduce our panel of experts for today's session. Uh, we are having faculty uh, here from uh, local faculty and the national faculty. Uh, we are honored to have uh, among our panel of experts, Professor Abid Amin, uh, he is the ex-head of cardiology department, Bolan Medical Complex Hospital, Quetta, and he's the ex-president, Pakistan Cardiac Society. Uh, Professor Raj Kumar, he's the head of cardiology department in Sakkar. Uh, professor, associate professor, Dr. Abdul Ghaffar. Uh, he's working as associate professor in cardiology department at Civil Hospital, Quetta. Dr. Fazlur Rahman, he's working uh, as associate professor in cardiology department, Quetta. Uh, uh, Dr. Huma Naeem Tareen, she is working as head of cardiology department at Bolan Medical Complex Hospital and working as associate professor. Uh, we are glad to have our young uh, cardiologist, Dr. Hashim Badej. He is working as assistant professor in cardiology department, civil hospital, Quetta. Uh, so this is the local faculty from Quetta, and uh, we are very uh, honored to have from the national faculty, Professor Mahmoud al Hassan. He is the head and chairman of cardiology department at Hayatabad Medical Complex Hospital, Peshawar. He's currently the president of Pakistan Cardiac Society. Uh, we're also honored to have the, pre the presence of Professor Sayed Tahir Shah. Sayed Tahir Shah is the vice president, and he's one of the key players in Pakistan Cardiac Society, organizing these web series of uh, webinars. Uh, thank you all for joining us today in this web series. And uh, you can put your question in the chat box. Uh, and uh, before we go, um, if, uh, before we involve our panel of experts, let me introduce our speaker for today's session, who is going to talk about the guideline uh, directed medical management of heart failure uh, it's Dr. Abdul, uh, Sayyid Abdul Bari. He is working as assistant professor uh, in cardiology department at Bolan Medical College, Quetta. Uh, Dr. Sayyid Abdul Bari is an interventional cardiologist and uh, in his daily practice, he's dealing in, with patients of heart failure. Uh, Dr. Bari, the floor is yours. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Jalal. I'm grateful that uh, Pakistan Cardiac Society has provided me this opportunity uh, to express my uh, knowledge and express my wording with, uh, on this forum and uh, to share it with the uh, level faculty. So I was find that uh, we have to talk on the uh, heart failure series of uh, webinars in which uh, this heart failure is now is, uh, discussed. And uh, among this heart, heart failure, I'm going to uh, say something about the heart failure reduce ejection factor. And my main focus uh, of this presentation will be, uh, I will be discussing the recommendation as per new EAP guidelines. So mostly I will be discussing the class one recommendation. Uh, sorry, Dr. Baika, can I just interrupt you? Uh, there, there are some voices coming. Can you just mute? I, I think one of the panel of experts uh, uh... The voice is coming from there. Can the rest of the uh, panel of experts mute their uh, speakers? Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, as I told that uh, my focus of this discussion will be heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And that heart failure with reduced as a very fast uh, topic, I can.
cannot cover in this just 20 25 minute uh, discussion and uh, so i will be focusing mainly on the uh, guideline that is medical therapy and plasma patients uh, in patients with heart failure will reduce infection uh, as dr jalal has already uh, introduced myself so i will skip and uh, the next slide so today uh, the topic which i will be discussing this presentation that will be i will go for the heart failure then i will discuss some causes of heart failure then uh, i will be discussing uh, stages as per new guidelines then classification of the heart failure according to function fraction and uh, stage wise recommendation uh, as most of the people listening to this webinar they know that according to new guidelines it has been divided into stage a stage b stage c and stage d so stage wise recommendation will be discussed in this uh, uh, presentation then i will uh, just uh, briefly discuss some uh, medical therapies and its uh, evidence based benefits and uh, there are some other agents which i will be discussing other than the class 1 recommendations some non pharmacological measures will be discussed in my presentation and uh, lastly i will give a touch to uh, management of decompensated heart failure and uh, heart failure patients who also uh, gets affected with uh, cardiogenic shock and in some special circumstances like in pregnancy and heart failure so these will be my areas of discussion Uh, as per AHA guideline, the definition of the heart failure it is defined as heart failure is a complex clinical syndrome with symptoms and signs that result from any structural or functional impairment of ventricular filling or ejection of blood. So this is briefly a small definition of the heart failure. Then coming towards heart failure causes, the most common cause of uh, heart failure is we all know that is ischemic heart disease. ischemic heart disease is the, the most common cause uh, resulting into heart failure then there are some non ischemic heart uh, non ischemic causes of heart failure like uh, patients get, getting chemotherapy or other cardiotoxic medications for cancer uh, heart failure also occurs in patients having rheumatologic or autoimmune diseases and there are some endocrine and metabolic conditions in which the patient Uh, along with this disease the patient also gets heart failure so uh, there are some cases in which patient uh, get familial cardiomyopathies or inherited or genetic heart disease heart rhythm related like in tachyarrhythmias or pvcs or rv pacing hypertension is another most common cause uh, especially in patients with long standing hypertension and aged people infiltrative cardiac diseases can lead towards heart failure like amyloidosis sarcoidosis hemochromatosis myocarditis especially in our setting if we see beginning from the uh, childhood the patient gets uh, uh, myocarditis and later on develops heart failure uh, infective causes toxins immunological or hypersensitivity peripartum cardiomyopathy is again a very common entity stress cardiomyopathy like tocobo syndrome and uh, some substance use due to some sub substance these are actually the causes of which can lead to a heart failure um, as i was discussing that uh, initially the uh, this stages of heart failure came after the 22 20, uh, 2022 guidelines aha in which they have uh, now staged the um, they have enrolled rather uh, so many the uh, population in this heart failure that in stage a the, uh, it includes those patient who are at risk of heart failure they have not even developed the symptoms of heart failure but they can in future develop heart failure so these are the patients at risk for heart failure but they are not having some current or previous symptoms or signs of heart failure and especially who are those uh, patients those are the patients having hypertension cardiovascular disease diabetes exposure to some cardiotoxic agents or uh, uh, or uh, any familial history of uh, this cardiomyopathy so uh, it encircles a lot of uh, a very huge population uh, the second one the stage b actually it is labeled uh, as the pre heart uh, failure stage these are the patients again they are not having some current or previous symptoms but they are having some uh, evidence of structural heart disease 
like one of the following they are having they might be having some uh, lv dysfunction due to previous mi or uh, evidence of increased filling pressure uh, these are the patients uh, who are having risk factors of increased uh, these patients can present with increased uh, bnp levels or or persistently elevated cardiac troponin levels in the absence of any competing diagnosis uh, while stage c are the uh, these include the patients these are actually the symptomatic heart failure patients these patients uh, might have got symptoms in the past or these might be currently symptomatic and they might be on anti failure therapy already while stage d it is labeled uh, and it is it that uh, is in those patients who are having advanced heart failure so these patients are having marked heart failure symptoms and that in interfere with their daily life and they also get recurrent hospitalization so uh, our attempts will be uh, to optimize the guideline directed medical therapy in these patients these are the stages of heart failure next the heart failure is also classified according to the ef and in this um, a few new uh, entities are also introduced after this guidelines heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is labeled when the lv ejection fraction is less than or equal to 40% heart failure with improved ejection fraction are those who are previously having heart failure with uh, low ef ef less than or equal to 40% but later on follow up uh, these patient gets improved so this entity is called heart failure with improved ejection fraction there is another entity uh, called heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction and these patient the ejection fraction uh, remains between 41 to 49% not more than 50% not less than 40% and heart failure with preserved uh, ejection fraction we already know that uh, these are the patients having lv ejection fraction of more than equal to 50% so i will just uh, uh, give a brief um, uh, just a small discussion about pre heart failure and stage b heart failure like uh, we in our daily life we come across such patients that uh, these patients are uh, just having hypertension or diabetes or high cholesterol level so these will be labeled in uh a stage a heart failure and for this stage a heart failure what are the recommendations in this guidelines this guideline says that in patients with heart failure if the patient is having hypertension so the blood pressure should be controlled in accordance with gdmp and uh, if the patient is having diabetes the diabetes must be addressed especially uh, these patients should be given uh sglt2 inhibitor as uh, anti diabetic medication in, in their medication sglt2 inhibitor carries class 1 indication and uh, of course uh, these patient will be uh, in general population these patient will be educated about lifestyle modification so these will be um, their li lifestyle modification will be monitored they will be asked for regular physical activities and they will be having healthy dietary patterns uh then coming towards stage b like this is a scenario of a 68 years old retired school teacher uh, had an anterior wall mi in the past and uh, with a ef of 38% but currently he is asymptomatic so what are the recommendations for such patients these patients uh, for these patient the guidelines say that if the patient is having ef of less than or equal to 40% ac inhibitor should be included in their management and uh, statin should be there in in their management arbs if they are intolerant or they are having some uh, other issue with uh, ac inhibitor so arb will be given as an alternative and beta blockers again are in their uh, main management and if the patient is having uh, less e, uh, ef of less than or equal to 30% and post mi more than 40 days post mi an icd is recommended for these patients and uh, beta blocker are not having benefits of mortality benefits rather it is also used as a, as for symptomatic benefits and in these patients uh, some uh, tazolidine dions they should not be given in in these patients uh, also these patients uh, in, in some non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers are contraindicated in such patients so oh, there is another case of a 70 years old lady recently hospitalized for heart failure symptoms managed and being discharged such patients 
come in uh, uh, stage C heart failure. So uh, now uh, the main management which I will be focusing that will include the patients having stage C and stage D, uh, uh, stage C and C, stage D heart failure patients. So this is a very important algorithm. In this algorithm, you can see that uh, if it is a bit small, you can uh, zoom it. The, the in stage C heart failure, st stage C and st stage D. How will we approach, and uh, how how will we proceed in, in such patients? In this, first of all, the clinical assessment is very important. In clinical ass assessment, history taking and physical examination and basic labs like ECG and basic laboratory investigations, including BNP levels. Then we will proceed towards uh, doing transthoracic echocardiography. And if needed, uh, we need some information beyond transthoracic echocardiography. We can uh, also advise uh, other additional uh, imaging testing. If the heart failure is diagnosed and it's confirmed, then we will classify according to stages, whether it comes in stage, uh, whether it comes in LV, uh, EF with reduced ejection fraction, with mildly, mildly reduced ejection fraction, or it is in the preserved ejection fraction. So later on, our uh, evaluation and other uh, treatment will be started. So now, as I've already discussed, that mainly I will be focusing on stage D and st stage C and stage D management. So in that, uh, first of all, history taking and physical examination is important. In uh, history taking and physical examination, vital signs are very important and evidence of clinical congestion should be assessed. In initial, our initial assessment, we should uh, assess the patient for evidence of clinical congestion we will be having a detailed history and physical examination that also carries class one indication. A three generation family history should be taken. And uh, again, history uh, and physical examination should direct our diagnostic strategies to uncover specific causes that may warrant disease specific management. And we also should identify cardiac and non cardiac disorders and lifestyle and behavioral factors and social determinants of health. Uh, that might cause or accelerate the development and progression of heart failure. Uh, recommendation of initial laboratory uh, among uh, recommendation, what are the recommendation of initial laboratory and electrocardiographic testing, ECG and uh, again ECG and uh, lab investigations, the specific cause of heart sh failure should be explored. And these are the labs which include CBC, urine analysis, electrolytes, urea nitrogen, Red urea nitrogen, serum, creatinine, glucose, lipid profile, liver function test, iron studies, and TSH or thyroid tests. And of course, 12 read ECG should be performed at the initial encounter of, uh, to optimize management. And uh, after those baseline, then coming towards the cardiac imaging, in this, the a chest x ray should be obtained and a transthoracic echocardiography should be done. Uh, and if needed, a repeat measurement of EF for a degree of structural remodeling and valvular function are useful to inform uh, therapeutic intervention. And there, there are some alternative imaging techniques like uh, cardiac MR or CT scan if needed, if the information is not gathered by baseline investigations or transthoracic echocardiography, we can go for this. These all carry class one indications. Now coming towards uh, management. In the management, if you see, uh, there are some uh, benefits of evidence-based therapies. and uh, These have got relative risk reduction in all-cause mortality, and these include AC inhibitor or ARB, uh, ERNI, beta blockers, mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, SGLT2 inhibitors, hydralazine or nitrates combination, CRT and ICD. Uh, now, individual one by one, I will discuss the recommendation of these drugs. So, ACE inhibitor, ARB, or ARNI. ARNI is a class one drug. Uh, the use of ARNI is recommended to reduce mortality and, mor and morbidity. And the use of ACE inhibitor is beneficial to reduce morbidity and mortality when the use of ARNI is not feasible. Again, ARB is, uh, is used when above two are not indicated or above two are uh, not tolerated by the patient. And this AC inhibitor or ARB carries, uh, it provides a high economic value. 
and um, in patients with chronic symptomatic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and functional class 2 or 3 what, uh, who can tolerate ac inhibitor or arv replacement by an ERNI is recommended to further reduce morbidity and mortality the indication of beta blocker again it carries class 1 indication the, if the patient is having class c or d uh, symptoms use of one of the one of the three beta blockers uh, including bisoprolol, carbidolol, or sustained release metoprolol succinate. It carries class one indication, and it has got a, uh, it provides high economic value. Uh, mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, it also carries class one indication, and it also carries uh, class one indication. But this uh, MRAs, these cannot be used, or these are contraindicated in those patients who cannot maintain their potassium level below 0.5 milliequivalents. So it carries class three indication. Uh, these are the recommendation for SGLT2 inhibitors, carries class one indication to reduce hospitalization for heart failure and cardiovascular mortality, irrespective of the presence of type two diabetes. It must be given in all patients and it carries uh, an intermediate economic value. Then in African Americans, it is indicated that you can use hydralazine and isosorbide dinitrate combination as a class one indication. And uh, otherwise, uh, in other patients, this combination carries a class two B indication. Uh, there are some other drugs other than class one indication uh, drugs, including that uh, ivabradin. As I've already discussed, that ivabradin can be beneficial to reduce heart failure, hospitalization. But if the pa uh, this patient must be uh, already taking beta blocker uh, uh, for for their first line management. Uh, digoxin carries class two B indication, and there is another agent, uh, oral soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator, very got. It carries class two B indication. There are some other drugs whose uh, these drugs are actually contraindicated and they do not have any proven benefit. These include non dihydropyridine calcium channel blocking drugs, class uh, 1C antiarrhythmic medication, uh, thiazolidine dione, uh, and uh, DPP4 inhibitors, and also these uh, uh, NSAIDs. They worsen heart failure symptoms and should be avoided or withdrawn whenever possible. Uh, after this uh, drug management, uh, then I'm coming towards non-pharmacological intervention. In non-pharmacological intervention, every heart failure patient should be uh, managed by a multidisciplinary team to facilitate the implementation of GDMP and uh, to address potential barriers to self-care and reduce risk of subsequent hospitalization for heart failure. These are uh, uh, very important point for non-pharmacological, among non-pharmacological measures is uh, the patient uh, should receive specific education and support to facilitate heart failure self-care in multidisciplinary manner. And uh, in patients with heart failure, uh, vaccination is very important. It carries class two indication for all respiratory illnesses or other illnesses. Uh, another class two B indicator, two A indication is of uh, heart failure. Uh, screening for depression, social isolation, and low health uh, li literacy, fertility. These uh, issues should be uh, uh, addressed for every heart failure patients. Uh, as uh, in the initial slides, I've discussed the, moon, the most common cause of uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is coronary artery disease. So if a patient is uh, suitable for uh, having suitable anatomy uh, for revascularization, so that patient must be sent for revascularization of coronary artery disease. And patients having, uh, the, if the reason is uh, valvular heart disease, those patients uh, the uh, valvular heart disease should be managed in a multidisciplinary manner in accordance with clinical practice guidelines. And if the patient is having, uh, along with cardiomyopathy, the patient is having secondary MR and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, 
after optimizing the GDMT, it is recommended that patients should go for uh, intervention, that is edge-to-edge -edge repair of mitral valves. Uh, then, uh, in the initial slide, as I, uh, as I have discussed, that uh, there are some entities like heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction. In that, every patient having mildly reduced ejection fraction, SGLT2 inhibitor carries class 2A indication. These are beneficial in decreasing heart failure hospitalization. And uh, among patients with current or previous symptomatic heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction, Use of evidence-based beta blockers for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, ARNI, AC inhibitor, or ARB or MRAs may be considered to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization and cardiovascular mortality, particularly among patients with LVF on the lower edge of the spectrum. And uh, in patients with heart failure with improved ejection fraction, it is recommended that these patients uh, irrespective of the symptoms, these patients should continue this guideline directory medical therapy uh, even after improve, improvement in the heart failure uh, symptoms or ejection fraction. Uh, referral for uh, any specialty care it carry of uh, patients with advanced heart failure, it carries class 1 indication. Now, some points about decompensated heart failure. In patients hospitalized with heart failure, severity of congestion and adequacy of perfusion should be assessed in the initial uh, encounter. Then uh, the common precipitating factors should be, should be sought out, that what is the reason the patient is uh, being admitted for decompensation. And uh, all the reversible factors should be addressed. Uh, the treatment includes all the reversible factors should be addressed and established uh, to establish an optimal volume status in advance uh, GDMT towards target for up titration therapy or patient therapy. The DVT prophylaxis in all the admitted patients, it carries class one indication. Uh, in the uh, patients uh, having decompensated heart failure, I, uh, uh, especially those patients who are in cardiogenic shock, inotropic support should be started in those patients. Uh, so, sorry, in the, in the patients with heart failure admitted with evidence of significant fluid overload, uh, they should promptly be treated with uh, IV group diuretics to improve symptoms and reduce mor morbidity. And uh, this uh, diuretic therapy, uh, its, dose should be, it, its dosage should be titrated with a goal to resolve uh, clinical evidence of congestion. And uh, it, it also carries uh, class 1 indication that in their discharge regime, this uh, diuretic uh, therapy should be included. And uh, in patients hospitalized with heart failure when diuresis in, in, is inadequate to relieve symptoms and size of congestion, it is reasonable to intensify the diuretic regime using either high doses of intravenous loop diuretics or by addition of second diuretic. And uh, these are the recommendations for uh, patients with cardiogenic shock. In patients with cardiogenic shock, uh, uh, IV inotropic support should be used to maintain systemic perfusion and preserve uh, end organ performance. In such patients, uh, temporary mechanical uh, circulatory support uh, carries class 2 indication. Uh, there are some special circumstances like some comorbidities along with the uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. If the patient is anemic, uh, his or her anemia should be corrected with IV iron supplements. Uh, erythropoietin stimulating agent is contraindicated. It should not be used. Uh, up titration of uh, GDMT to maximize the tolerance in hypertensive patients. In uh, sleep disorders, formal sleep studies and sleep assessment should these are reasonable and uh, CPAP uh, or continuous uh, positive airway pressure is plus two indication in such patients. And, uh, but adoptive servo ventilation causes harm, so it is contraindicated. And in patients with diabetes, again, I've already discussed that SGLT2 inhibitor is recommended. In patients with uh, heart failure and AFib, 
If the child BASC score is more than or equal to two, chronic anticoagulation therapy is recommended. In that uh, uh, anticoagulation therapy, DOAC is recommended over warfarin. Uh, AF ablation for those patients having uh, uh, heart failure and AF symptoms, uh, symptomatic heart failure and AF, AF ablation is uh, class 2A indication. And uh, AV nodal uh, ablation uh, with implantation of CRT is also two indication in those patients having EF of less than or equal to 50%. And uh, again, uh, for patients with chronic heart failure and permanent uh, AF, uh, chronic anticoagulation therapy is reasonable for men and women without additional risk factor. In pregnancy, uh, in, in women uh, having pregnancy with heart failure, counseling regarding contraception carries class 1 indication. Uh, if the EF is less than or equal to 30%, anticoagulation is class 2B indication. And all these agents are contraindicated, uh, including ACE inhibitor, ARB, ERNI, MRAs, SGLT2 inhibitor, ivabradin, and varicigol. These should not be used. So uh, due to uh, uh, some time issue, I will uh, just summarize this, that uh, we should know, uh, according to new guideline, we should be knowing the stages of the heart failure, we should be uh, knowing that the new terminologies of heart failure with mild reduced ejection fraction and heart failure with improved ejection fraction, we should know the classification according to the EF. Then uh, everybody should be aware of the four pillars, uh, including ERNI, SGLG2 inhibitors, beta blockers, and MRAs. And uh, then in advanced cases, the device therapy, ICT, mechanical security support, CRT for eligible candidates. And uh, also we should be knowing the uh, heart failure patients having comorbidity and, uh, and heart failure patients like in AF and pregnancy. I'm grateful for your uh, patients. Thank you very much. Well, excellent, excellent uh, talk, uh, Dr. Bari. I think covered you covered every aspect of heart failure I believe it's quite a big topic. It's a, a, quite a huge area and covering all in half hour is not an easy a job. You, you you did the job very well, very well done. Thank you very much. I think uh, coming to our panel of experts, uh, the heart failure, uh, we'll just see, uh, cons considering our local perspective and uh, where uh, what areas we can improve. Uh, what our local practices is. Uh, do we have Professor Abid Amin online? Uh, Professor Abid? Sir, can you unmute yourself? Uh, can you listen to me? Yeah, 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 sir, we can hear. Uh, you are audible now. Uh, well, uh, we, we come across these patients, uh, Dr. Bari very well elaborated uh, those patients' uh, stages of heart failure. Uh, so Ma, you, your uh, comment, your approach to those patients who are in asymptomatic phase of heart failure, like patient with stage A, stage B, those with risk factors and those with structural heart disease but are not symptomatic, how do you approach, how do you manage such patients of stage A and stage B? Uh, thank you, Dr. Jalal, asking me for my comments. First, I will congratulate uh, Dr. Abdul Bari for such a nice presentation. Mm -hmm. And he has almost covered all the aspects of heart failure right away from definition and up till the non-pharmacological means of uh, management of heart failure. Mm -hmm. And as far as your question is concerned, that in the early stages like stage A, where the patient is asymptomatic. So at that stage, it is very important if he does not have a significant risk factors. So he have to go for lifestyle modification. That is very important. And plus he has to, uh, his, uh, uh, those risk factors which ultimately will lead to heart failure should be managed accordingly. Like if they, he has a hypertension, he has a valvular heart disease, or uh, other uh, cardiomyopathies, so should be treated accordingly, but lifestyle modification at that stage is very important. And coming to stage two, where the patient is in the pre-heart failure, that is very important stage. Either you we can manage uh, that patient uh, according to the guidelines, and they can be reversed back to stage one. 
or if not properly managed medically plus non-pharmacologically, they will go into the symptomatic heart failure. And uh, one thing I will add uh, as a comment in our common practice, that is uh, uh, when we treat patient in stage three and stage four, and particularly when uh, we use SGLT2 inhibitor and RNA in, uh, in these patients along with the uh, beta blockers and uh, uh, MRA, these patients usually uh, they uh, go in hypotension with significant hypotension. What I have seen in my practice, uh, in those, particularly in those patients who are in half ref so in such patients, uh, either we reduce the dose uh, of these uh, SSG, SGLT2 inhibitors or uh, ARNIs, uh, and rather uh, then these patients usually will go for rehospitalization, and the morbidity and mortality is very high in these patients. And in such a patient, yeah. it is preferable that these patients should go for ICDs or uh, the for the device therapy. Jalal? Yeah, so thank you very much. I think uh, 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 your points are very well heard. Uh, do we have Dr. Ghaffar online? Dr. Ghaffar, your thoughts on the local challenges on the, considering our local challenges and the consideration uh, regarding the guidelines, the current guidelines, How? what challenges locally do we face treating these patients of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction? Uh, I think Dr. Ghaffar, he's online. So by the time yes. we get Ghaffar, G you, G Ghaffar. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're audible, Ghaffar. You're audible. Can you turn on your camera? It'll be good to see you. Uh, I think I have not issues. I'm on the mobile now. Right now. All right, all right. Thank you, Dr. Jalal, for having me on this forum. I think regarding your question, two, three areas are very important to be addressed. First thing, I think awareness and education, especially among the practitioner or in our peripheries, they are doing the general medicine practice. They are unaware of about the guidelines and the recommendation. So Pakistan Cardiac Society needs to do the efforts to increase the awareness and education among the practitioners about these guidelines to be recommended to, to implement among the Pakistani population uh, patient with heart failure. Number second, I think Pakistan, in Pakistan, we need a good health care infrastructure. We need a good health care system for the implementation of these guidelines with the trained professionals, diagnostics tools, and follow-up. We, we don't have any diagnostic tools in the therapy diagnose these patients and if we diagnose these patients we lost the, in the follow of these patients most of the patients number third i think the medication accessibility and the cost consideration many of the recommended medication which dr bari highlighted the four pillars of the heart failure medication might not be readily available or affordable for majority of the population of the pakistan High drug price prices can limit its use. I think these are the area which should be addressed by the Pakistan Cardiac Society in the coming years. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ghaffar. Nice comments. Uh, I, I do agree. We've got a lot of challenges, local challenges, cons uh, considering our patients and our approach. But, but your point, I think, very well explained. Pub Awareness is very important, and we have to educate our patient regarding heart failure. It's not just about pharmacotherapy. It's also about lifestyle and uh, non-pharmacological therapy that uh, uh, we we need to address. Uh, Dr. Hashim, your thought for, for our patients, we, we see these heart failure patients, and these patients come regularly, very much burden on our health system. Uh, any thought, suggestion for improvement? Why are patients... They, they, they come back to the hospitals frequently. Um, is it a failure of the physician? Is it a failure of the pharmacotherapy? Or is there uh, something on the part of the patients that is missing? So what are the common causes of uh, these patients coming back to hospital in our practice? 
Dr. Hashim, are you there? Assalamu alaikum. Can you unmute? Wa alaikum assalam ji. Sir, can you hear me now? Yeah, 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 you're pretty much audible. Uh, thank you, sir, Jalal, for organizing such a nice activity. And uh, I'm really grateful for, for to Pakistan Cardiac Society for arranging such a nice educational webinar for the most important cardiology topics. And one of them is the heart failure. Uh, as uh, you, the Dr. Ghaffar Sahib already mentioned that there are certain factors which contribute to the quite often uh, readmissions of these patients in our setups. Most important, the first of all, I would say is the drug compliance. Quite often these patients, they receive multiple uh, regime of drugs that include diuretics, that include beta blockers, the all medications which Dr. Bari has excellently covered in his presentation. The compliance to these medications is very important. Patient, patient education, as Sir Ghaffar has also, uh, already mentioned, that quite often we don't have that proper patient education on discharge. We should have a checklist for uh, these patients on discharge that they should take their medicines regularly. They should have their all the risk factors, how to uh, uh, tell them regarding the medications to, uh, to avoid the precipitating factors. Quite often, these our, in our society, these patients, they suffer from chest infections that lead to ex acute exacerbation and they get admitted. Another important factor is the cost factor. These patients, they have got multiple comorbids like diabetes, hypertension, and other comorbidities, they are taking multiple medications for these indications, and the cost is an important factor. So that's why the drug compliance, the side effect of the drugs, the precipitating factors, that all lead and the lack of pre proper education. We should educate all the patients on discharge that how to measure their, uh, their urine output, how to take their daily uh, weight, and how to adjust their diuretics according to the symptoms. So these are the factors that lead to readmissions quite open in our setup. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Ashim. Yes, indeed. Indeed, these are the areas non-compliance to medication and non-compliance to life, to, to diet, dietary interventions. The calmness risk factor, again, counseling and patient education comes into play. Uh, do we have Dr. Huma or rest of the panel of experts? And just, uh, I can't see our panel of experts. Uh, Dr. Bari, starting from all those patients who get indoor admissions, uh, you know, at times we get fluid overloaded patients, patients with refractory heart failure, with reduced ejection fraction. We come across them in our daily practices, get admitted in CCU, in cardiology units, in medical units. At times, the diuretics, when we talk of, of the other, the, the four uh, uh, mortality, morbidity reducing drugs, other than that, those patients who remain symptomatic who present with diuretic resistance in acute heart failure patients. Your thought on diuretic resistance at times and how to manage such patients. Uh, anyone, Dr. Hashim, if you if you want to carry on on those patients or Dr. Uh, just, just let me share one thing else that uh, uh, among precipitating factors that uh, when patients come with recurrent hospitalization, I have seen in our setup the most common cause Although the precipitating factor causes might be in uh, Western societies, the causes might be something else. But I have seen in my uh, experience that uh, the most common cause of uh, rehospitalization are one of them is uh, uh, infections. Infections are very common among uh, our, our patients, especially in elderly patients. They usually come with, uh, most of the time they come with urosepsis. And with the advent of this new drug, SGLT2 inhibitors, we have seen that these patients very commonly gain the uh, urosepsis. They, uh, they come with UTIs and complicated UTIs. Uh, another uh, reason for uh, this uh, uh, non-compliance of the medications, and among those medications, especially the diuretics, the patients are uh, not uh, used to... Uh, to uh, themselves uh, in accordance with daily use of diuretics. They are uh, due to our this uh, social and cultural reasons. The patients they 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 take other medications, but they uh, skip these uh, di diuretics. And uh, for uh, this diuretic resistance, uh, of course, uh, we should uh, search for the cause of this diuretic resistance. 
that what is the reason is patient having some renal issue or uh, is patient having some uh, GI issue or some other issues that patients are resistant to diuretics. And uh, I will also uh, ask Dr. Hashim to uh, say something about this. So Dr. Hashim, please kindly, if, if you... Uh... Yeah, Hashim, your, your, your thoughts on, on these uh, patients. Thank and you, so also in those Sanjana. patients where ro the role of inotropes, inotropic supports in these decompensated heart failure patients Mm, yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, I would add a few points regarding approach to diuretic resistance in these patients. Uh, first of all, we should know what is adequate diuresis. Basically, adequate diuresis is defined as urine of output of more than 150 ml per hour. If a patient has got 150 ml per hour of urine output, it means he or she has good urine output. And uh, the spot urine sodium that should be more than 50 at two hours. If the patient has got these parameters, then we call it as these patients are not diuretic resistant. So as far as the uh, etiology of diuretic resistance is concerned, there are certain factors. We call it as renal, extra renal, and pharmacology. As far as the pharmacology is concerned, the main, the, the most important one is the inadequate dose. Quite often, these patients, they receive the diuretics in not in that proper dose that is required for these patients. The next important uh, point is the poor absorption. As we know that these patients, they have got venous congestions. As a result, there is a, a gut venous congestion. So these patients, when they take medications orally, they are not properly absorbed. As far as the external factors are concerned, the most important, as we all know, is the reduced cardiac output. There is hypoalbuminemia in these patients as well. Uh, and there are certain intrarenal causes as well, like there is increased proximal tubular sodium absorption, there is, uh, a, a ref, uh, there is a, a decreased renal perfusion pressure, mean arterial pressure of the renal, corpus, uh, renal corpuscles, they are reduced. So as a result, these patients become re, uh, uh, diuretic resistant. So how to treat these patients? First of all, the most important thing is that we should, we should switch over to IV medications. So how to switch over? Then we have to at least double the dose of oral medication. Suppose if a patient is receiving 40 milligram of uh, furosemide, we should double the dose and we should increase the frequency. Or in these cases, even we can give the uh, IV continuous infusion of uh, furosemide. So number one is the increasing the dose. The next important point is inotropic support. As we know that these patients, they are they have got low cardiac output. So as a result, they got uh, increased resistance to diuretics. The third important point which I should mention is that as we know that these patients, they have got increased compensatory sodium absorption. So we can knock out whole of the absorption system of the sodium from the renal tubules. So how to knock it out? We can knock it out by giving combination of two diuretics. Number one, we can give acetazolamide or we can add metalozone in with uh, loop diuretics. But remember, these uh, adding of two medications which act on various target sites on the loop of Henle or the distal conjunctive tubule, they can lead to marked hyponatremia or, and marked hypokalemia, uh, hypokalemia. So we should monitor these patients for electrolytes and for the renal imbalance. So then we can manage these patients very well. Well, thank you, Dr. Ashim. I think you excellently covered those patients with decompensated and acute heart failure that in our daily practice, we come across uh, uh, metalazone you touched upon, a very important drug at times in, in, in patients with refractory heart failure. Uh, also, we come across in such patients, uh, re there's renal involvement, how to take care of kidneys in patients with heart failure. Do we have Dr. Homa online? Before we come to uh, discussion on the fantastic four anti failure treatments. Dr. Huma? Uh, Dr. Fazan? Uh, do we have our big guns, President Pakistan Cardiac Society, Professor Mahmood? I think we are having. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Rafan, your comments on patients with chronic kidney disease. How do you deal with such patients with chronic kidney disease and uh, heart failure? How do you take care of the kidneys? I think uh, uh, before starting the four pillars of medication, it is very important to know about the renal status of the patient, especially among the diabetic patients. Most of the heart failure patients 
most of the patients are diabetic, having some uh, chronic renal insufficiency. In such a patient, I think before starting the poor drugs, we must know about the renal status. If the renal is compromised, I think we must not start the ARNI, AC inhibitor, and ARBs, especially in the, the other thing, this menorocalicard antagonist. We must avoid these initially. And we have the medication in, instead of these to start with the hydralazine and the, the dinitrate combination and with having beta blocker and all these things. A patient having the CKD and heart failure, we have to adjust our medication accordingly. Because these patients, most of the patients do not have enough uh, urine formation. So we have to increase the dose of uh, loop diuretics. But on the, on, the, on the next side, we have to avoid these medications which increase the potassium level among these patients. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ghaffar. I think uh, Dr. Bari uh, very well covered the diagnostic tools, which la what labs to be done, and what are the areas that need to be taken care of. Uh, Dr. Fazal, if you're there, any role of right heart cath in patients with heart failure, with reduced ejection fraction, your thoughts on role of right heart cath? We come across patients where there's RV failure and at times right heart cath need to be done. Your thought, uh, Dr. Fazal, if you're there online? Uh, Dr. Fazal, if you're there, can you unmute I yourself? Think if we... Yeah, Dr. Ghaffar, if you want to respond to that question. Yeah, uh, I think if the patient is having isolated right heart failure, then I think we can consider the right heart cath. Otherwise, if having biventricular heart failures, the right heart failure is mostly because of the left heart failure. If we having biventricular heart failure, we know we don't need the, any right heart cath. If it's isolated and you are looking for the cause, then I think we can do the right heart cath. Right, thank you. Uh, well, Professor Abid, when we come to these new molecules that have come into the business during the last five, 10 years, uh, so medical approach to those patients who come out of the acute crisis and uh, with reduced ejection fraction, what is your approach to such patients who needs beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, RNA, RB, mirlocorticoid receptor antagonists, and the new one, SGLT2 inhibitors, which have very much become the frontliner so how, what is your approach in such patients? Uh, Professor Abid is probably offline. He's gone offline. And G, Dr. Hashim. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. It's a, a very good question to answer it. Basically, we come across in clinical practice, the patients, they present in various variety. Quite often, patient comes to you with a tachycardia, but they have normal blood pressure. Sometimes patient comes to you, they are, they are not that much tachycardic, but they are in volume overload. So we have to optimize the medication for each and every case as a separate entity. Quite often, these patients, they have got uh, raised LVEDP. We can measure on echo by taking the E to A prime ratio. So by uh, adjusting their medications, uh, if a patient is tachycardic, we can increase the dose of the beta blockers to the optimal dose. One important thing which uh, I think uh, I should mention is the beta blockers that have got mortality benefit. These are the three, the most important one, carvidolol, bisoprolol, and metoprolol succinate. What uh, uh, our juniors or our residents, they should come to know that the metaprolol that, that is available in the market is the metaprolol tartrate. And the studies that has been conducted is on the extended release of the metoprolol succinate, and that is available by the brand name of Vitalox Zoc only. So the Mirol, if we advise, it does not have got that mortality benefit. It the trials that have been conducted is basically done on the metoprolol succinate, the extended release one. So we can adjust the treatment modality for each and every patient. If patients are volume overload, we can increase the dose of the diuretics. We can reduce the dose of the ERNI or AC inhibitors, whichever the patient is taking. If a patient is tachycardic, 
we can add on ivabradine to the patient who have got resting heart rate of more than 70 beats per minute. If these patients have got raised LVEDP, we can give or we can increase the dose of furosemide in these patients. So each and every patient, they, when they come to you in the clinic, they usually have got various precipitating factors. Uh, one important thing which I should add is the anemia. The iron deficiency anemia, it is very common in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection of fraction. And it is the entity which is uh, uh, a rather neglected one. We should check the uh, serum uh, hemoglobin and, uh, and ferritin saturation on each and every visit of the patient and regularly on every three months on follow-up. If those patients, uh, uh, for male, if the hemoglobin is less than 30 and for females, if the hemoglobin is less than 12, we should give iron uh, for those patients, especially who have got symptomatic left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 45%. And if they have got recurrent hospitalization, the correction of iron in the form of uh, car uh, ferric carboxymaltose with a dose of 500 to 1000 milligram of iron to correct the iron deficiency anemia has got markedly uh, benefit for reducing the hospitalization and improving the symptoms of these patients. So this is an entity which is quite a neglected one or rather I would say that these patients, they present with the iron deficiency anemia and we should correct the iron deficiency in these patients as well. I think a uh, very nice comment, Dr. Ashim. Other than just anti-failure treatment, we have to also think of the other core morbid that the patient might have, and iron deficiency is one of the added therapy that the heart failure patients need. Uh, Dr. Ha uh, Dr. Bari, I think uh, you, uh, I'd like to, 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 to know, to, to have your comments on those patients, on the new entity, those patients with heart failure whose ejection fraction in the past had been in 25, 30, uh, 20 percent for uh, now their ejection fraction is improved. How do you uh, manage such patients with improved ejection fraction? Uh, how do you manage their uh, manage them medically? Dr. Bari, you are on mute. Is, is, is my voice audible to you now? Yeah, yeah, you are audible. I, I discussed in my slides that uh, the patients. For uh, those patients who have got improved ejection fraction, and previously those patients were having an ejection fraction of less than 30%, but later on with the uh, uh, with management, the patient has uh, got their EF improved. So in those, the guidelines say that these patients should not be, uh, the, the treatment should not be stopped, stopped in these patients. These patients should be continuously under surveillance and these patients uh, must be taking all the guideline directed medical therapy. And if these patients are having some comorbidities like uh, uh, hypertension, diabetes, or other uh, associated diseases, those diseases should also be addressed along with uh, continuation of all these uh, four pillar medications. Well, thank you. I think we, uh, thank you, Dr. Bari. We've got Dr. Fazal. Yeah, if you want to say something, Dr. Fazal, welcome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jalal. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're audible now. We were uh, missing you. A yeah, part of discussion. Some, some of you is really short. I heard the whole lecture. Uh, and first of all, I congratulate the Pakistan Cardiac Society and the Dr. Bari for such a wonderful and very comprehensive and concise presentation. He almost uh, discussed every aspect of the heart failure. Uh, we know that heart failure is very common nowadays because of the increasing very good diagnostic uh, um, uh, tools as well as uh, improved care of patients. Uh, my uh, message for this uh, topic is that we should address the non-pharmacological means to improve the quality of life for such patients, which are often neglected, like diet, exercise, cardiac rehab, and uh, drug compliance, vaccination. These areas are very important, which we do not discuss in our routine practice. We do not uh, discuss with patients in routine practice. We must address these issues also. And uh, rest uh, all things, the pharmacological means are discussed in very detail, very elaborately, and I congratulate you once again. Well, thank you, Dr. Fazal. Uh, very, very important, very pertinent, and the non-pharmacological treatment. Yes, we emphasize in the mid of our talks, uh, very important that needs to be addressed, and they, they, they definitely have their role, the dietary compliance and that. So with this, I thank you all the panel of experts. I thank you, Dr. Bari. I thank the organizer, I thank Pakistan Cardiac Society 
for uh, giving us this opportunity to be the host for this. Thank you very much. Allah Hafiz.